Welcome to the OT. I'm Elise Jesse, and we're getting a little bit more professional here this week because it is game week after all. Coming to you from Paycor Stadium, the Cincinnati Bengals are hosting the Pittsburgh Steelers on Sunday at 1 o'clock. It's going to be a massive test for the Bengals' retooled offensive line. Jonah Williams is the only player starting from last year. So he's going to be alongside Ted Karras, Lael Collins. They're going to be in charge of stopping, wearing down guys like TJ Watt, Cam Hayward, Alex High Smith. That is no easy feat. That's going to be a difficult job for four quarters on Sunday, but it's a job that they must do because you don't want to see Joe Burrow get injured. You don't want to see him go down. You don't want him to try to play under duress as much as he did last year. So that's that's a big thing that I will be paying attention to on Sunday. And I was fortunate enough to talk to a guy who you have seen in a Bengals uniform. You've also seen him in a Pittsburgh uniform. You've seen him on national broadcasts and as an analyst. He's very good at his job here. Um, he's just such a wealth of knowledge. He's like a vault. He has so many stats that just roll off of his tongue. And I swear I learn something every single time I speak to him. Solomon Wilcots had a great conversation with him this week. And we talked about Joe Burrow you know, his retooled offensive line and the fact that he was sacked more than any other quarterback last year, but he also had the highest completion percentage at 70.4. Here's our conversation. All right, Solomon. So week one of the NFL season for the Cincinnati Bengals, and they open up with the Pittsburgh Steelers. Um, I would think that this would be a pretty big test for them, considering that Joe Burrow has just one starting lineman starting in front of him this year compared to last year. What do you think? Hey, I think it's great. I think that's good news for Joe Burrow. I think it's <laughs> yeah. good news for us who want to see Joe Burrow um, finish the season healthy and yeah. successful. Four new starters on the offensive line, uh, for, you know, compared to last year's. I, I think that shows you that this team was very targeted in its intention to improve everything around Joe Burrow to help him to be the best that he can be and to help the team to be the best they can be. Yeah, and I mean, they're going to be tested early because they have T.J. Watt. He had 22 and a half sacks last year. Um, Alex Highsmith, Cam Hayward, all coming at Joe Burrow. Um, how do you think that they'll fare, given that this is their first official game and real game speed together? Yeah, I think it's it's going to be that way for everyone, particularly for the Bengals, because they don't play a lot of their starters. Now, Mike Tomlin, he asked a lot of his guys, he asked them to go out and break a sweat. <laughs> during, the, during the preseason, right? right? Yes. Um, but but let's keep in mind, uh, the Pittsburgh Steelers, as bad as maybe they seem to have struggled over last year, maybe over the last couple of years, this is the only defense in the NFL with 50 or more sacks in each of the last five seasons. Last year, they led the league with 55 sacks, and but yet they were the worst when it came to stopping the run. They finished right. dead last in terms of their run defense. So, in my mind, I think you've got to be able to test that group and their ability to, to plug their run fits. I think if you want to get our offensive line going early to help develop some chemistry and some confidence in what they do, I think Frank Pollock and, uh, and Zach Taylor have to lean into the run game. I think we've got to rely early in the game on Joe Mixon to get to the second level of the defense, and that opens up everything from there. If we can get – if we can hammer away at the – the Pittsburgh Steelers run defense, um, they all have to commit another defender to the box, and that opens things up on the perimeter for Jamar Chase, T. Higgins. Tyler Boyd always plays big time against the Pittsburgh Steelers, so we got to feed him the ball too. But I think it starts with our ability to run the football because it helps our offensive line, um, and it's the worst thing that the Steelers' defense uh, – it's the worst thing they do is stop the run. So we got to lean into that very heavily. I fully agree with you. I mean, I, I know that when you have a quarterback like Joe Burrow and he's so efficient, I think he had a 70.4% completion yeah. percentage last year. And that's when he was under duress, under pressure consistently in every game. You still have to rely on Joe Mixon because he had, had what, 13 touchdowns last year, over 1,200 rushing yards. When yeah. you have a big back like that, I think it really opens up their offense. And I would think that that would allow a guy like Jamar Chase to maybe have a breakout game this year because last year he didn't fare too well against the Steelers' defense. Yeah, I mean, I, I do remember him having, like, one touchdown pass in that first game mm -hmm. uh, early on, right? It kind of caught, caught them by surprise, and then – 
I think from there they went, they, they really just lent so many resources to try to make sure that Chase didn't get another one on them, that Tyler Boyd just ate him alive. He started really making some plays and then everything else opened up from there. And it's not lost on me at least that the Cincinnati Bengals have won each of their last three games against the Pittsburgh Steelers. So I think the tide's already turned in our favor. How long of a leash do you think Mitchell Trubisky has under Mike Tomlin right now? Uh, Not a very long one, but I I do think because of the struggling uh, parts of this offensive line, their offensive line was in tatters last year. I think Ben covered up Mm -hmm. for a lot of uh, the mistakes that the offensive line made. Uh, Ben knew where to go with the ball, when to get rid of it. There was a lot of things I think he helped that offensive line um, improve upon, but um, they're very questionable and you don't want to start a rookie behind an offensive line that's very questionable. And so I do think Mitchell Trubisky is going to get the start. He looked good during the preseason, to be honest with you. I don't, I don't think he took, he, I don't think he lost his job. Let's just say that. But you and I both know that if a team used a first round pick on a quarterback and that quarterback like Kenny Pickett has done looked good at every step along the way, OTAs, preseason. Um, and so now it's just a matter of time, I think, because before he becomes their starter. But I think they're going to start off initially giving us some Mitchell Trubisky because of the experience, his mobility, his athleticism. I, I think they're going to start with the veteran quarterback. Well, and I think that he he does have some weapons. Um, yeah. George Pickens, Deontay Johnson, Chase Claypool. But mm-hmm. on the outside, it seems like Eli Apple um, and Chidobe Awuzie had really great years last year on the outside for that for the Bengals. Um, do you think it's possible to shut down their offense completely, especially without Big Ben out there to make up for some of the mistakes that we have seen? Yeah, it's going to be interesting because, to be honest with you, I don't know that anyone knows for sure what you're going <laughs> yeah. to get. Exactly. But Matt, Matt yeah. Canada, right? Matt Canada is the offensive coordinator. He would have liked to use all of his offense last year, but he knew he had a veteran quarterback in Big Ben Roethlisberger who didn't want to operate under center. He only wanted to be in the shotgun. And so I think we are going to see the quarterback for the Steelers under center. You're going to see them want to feature uh, Najee Harris. Um, mm-hmm. And rightfully so. He's a big back. He's yeah. got a lot of power. It's going to remind you a little bit of Joe Mixon, right? So they're going to want to lean into their run game to help a struggling offensive line, to help um, sort of solve some of the problems at the quarterback position, to sort of calm the waters. I think they're going to want to assert their physicality running the ball. I think we're going to want to do the same thing, and we'll have to see how it turns out. This this rivalry or this, this game between the Steelers and – and the uh, Cincinnati Bengals, I think, is going to feature some of the things that we've always seen. Both teams trying to impose their will uh, and their <laughs> physicality on the other. Well, and you bring up a really good point, the physicality between these two teams. Um, is somewhat unmatched within the AFC North, I think. that It seems like, well, especially in years past, um, both sides came away with so many injuries <laughs> from this rivalry game. Um, do you think we're going to see the same thing? Is it still going to be the same kind of, I don't want to say dog fight because I hate that term, but yeah. the same kind of, you know, aggressive type of play that we've seen in years past. Yeah. I don't think you can avoid it. Uh, these two teams, they embody that even uh, Zach Taylor, you know, in a conversation I had with him, he understands that the AFC North is different football. These are teams that are very physical. You might notice, hey, look, uh, there are no dome stadiums in in this division. So as the weather starts to turn, the mentality of asserting your physicality on the other team becomes even more primary and becomes even more important. And so that's it's going to always be ingrained in the way that teams within the AFC North are going to play the game, particularly when they're playing each other. It's going to always be part of a a Cincinnati Bengals Pittsburgh Steeler rivalry. I go back to um, the end of the 2020 season. Okay. Joe Burrow's out. They're playing in a Monday night game, and Vaughn Bell laid so many hits in that game. It set the tone for a game that nobody thought the Cincinnati Bengals would win, and they end up winning it because they won the physical battle, and they won every game since then against right. the Pittsburgh Steelers. That doesn't mean the Steelers are going to give up and 
wave a white flag of surrender in this one because that's not going <laughs> to happen. So I, I think both teams understand that at the end of the day, no matter who's at quarterback for these two teams, physicality is going to play a role in, in the outcome of the game. Speaking of physicality, L. Collins is going to be lined up with T.J. Watt. How how do you think that that matchup is going to go? I mean, that seems like one of the bigger matchups to actually watch in this game on Sunday. Yeah, yeah. So you you ask if you were to ask me when we run the ball, how is it going to match? <laughs> Lyle, Lyle Collins, it's a knockout. I yeah. could just tell you right now, Lyle Collins is a knock. If we run the ball at T.J. Watt, that allows Lyle Collins to really wear down a TJ Watt, if that's at all possible. Um, because this guy has great energy, great quickness and versatility in the way that he plays. But mm-hmm. if you were at TJ Watt, what would he rather do? Play the run um, with a big 300 pound guy leaning on him? Or would he rather get up the field with speed and get after the quarterback? He'd rather do the latter. Um, right. So we have to make him do the dirty work, make him get his Jersey dirty and allow Lyle Collins to lean on him for four quarters uh, but if it's a if it's going to be throw throw throw, and you clue in to what T.J. Watt wants to do, he has the advantage in in that battle. But if we're running at him, then I think the the advantage goes to Lyle Collins. Okay, I would agree with you there because you know T.J. Watt having twenty two and a half sacks last season is incredible, but. In order to continue to progress, he would have to have more sacks than he did last year, which sounds nearly impossible, right? Yeah, and the guy was banged up. He was hurt <laughs> right. um, during during portions of last year as well. So that tells you he's he's a chip off the old block. You know, I covered his yeah. brother, J.J. Watt, for a long time in the NFL. And, and what they bring um, to the game really is a special energy, is a special love for the game that allows them to play like their hair is on fire. And here's a guy that doesn't play for the money. He doesn't play for the glory. He plays because he just truly loves playing football. And that's the same that J.J. Watt, uh, the same approach that he brought to playing the game. And, and so uh, T.J. Watt is the same type of player. And so when you go to play against a guy like him, just know that he's going to bring it for four quarters. So you better be, you better be ready to bring it for four quarters also. I also wanted to ask you about just the shape of the AFC North, because now Baltimore seems like they're getting healthy once again, starting the year healthy, at least. Um, What do you, how do you think the AFC North is going to kind of shake out once we start going towards, you know, mid season and end of season? Well, the Bengals got ahead. I know, but yeah, no, it's okay. I think the Bengals showed you that this is a division the year before there were three teams that went to the playoffs from the AFC North in 2020. And then in 2021, the only team that didn't make it from the year before um, made it, it, you know, they ended up winning the division. If you could go from worst to first, it shows you how close these four teams really are. I think the Cleveland Browns have a talented roster. That backfield with Kareem Hunt and Nick Chubb, I think is the best. It's what we all want. Every team in the NFL would love to have that backfield. Um, and, and, and the defense is really good too. You have one of the best pass rushers in the game in miles Garrett, one mm-hmm. of the best shut down corner guys who I absolutely love Denzel Ward. Mm-hmm. And they have uh, safeties that, that are smart and that can play and turn you over. So Cleveland's going to be formidable and, and Baltimore, a healthy Baltimore. I always say about Lamar Jackson, he's must see TV. This guy is a com- <laughs> I agree. competitor and people need to realize this, you know, he played collegiately nearby at Louisville mm-hmm. and there's, there's something about him that he wants to shine whenever he comes back to pay stadium or come back to play the Bengals. He knows that people in the stands have driven up from Louisville to come see him play. And I think we need to understand that, We've got a certain portion of people coming up from Kentucky in our viewing area <laughs> to root for Lamar Jackson because that motivates yeah. him. He is that kind of competitor. So uh, we, it's a unique division. It always has been. Um, all four teams, uh, I think since the formation of the division back in 2002, you know, the Bengals have won their share of division titles. We mm-hmm. know the Steelers have and the Ravens have. The Browns are the only team who have never won a division title since the formation, the reformation of the AFC North, used to be the old AFC Central. 
when Houston was in there and everything. But no, this this division has been owned mostly by those three teams. And you know the Browns are getting tired of that, so they want to join the party. It's going to be hotly contested, there is no doubt. Now, I have the Bengals winning it again, but it, it's going to be far from easy. Right. I agree. And what do you think that the Bengals must do in order to win? You know, the coach always says, take care of the football, start fast. Those things are incredibly important. But what else would you add to that? No, I, I think it's about don't beat yourself. I think it's about okay. we the Bengals have the talent to beat anybody. I think it's yeah. clear. We I clear. We have a quarterback that gives us a chance to win each and every Sunday. Mm-hmm. And he taught me something that it, maybe I didn't even know. Um, that it's better to be sacked nine times than it is to throw three interceptions. Okay. <laughs> if Ryan Tannehill now knows that. <laughs> and so that goes to show you that if you turn the ball over, it's hard to win in this league. It's one thing. And Joe Burrow is so good at protecting the football that he'll take a sack because he has this blue collar, tough guy mentality. He'll live to fight another day. And eventually he's going to find a way to beat you as long as he's not throwing interceptions. So, That's going to be the real key. The Bengals can't beat themselves if they protect the football and finish in the top five as they did last year in terms of having the fewest penalties, second fewest Mm -hmm. penalties of any team in the league last year. If they do that, they give themselves a chance to win each and every week against anybody. And so I think it's a well-coached team, and I think it's a talented team that that, uh, Duke Tobin put together. And so it's going to be a fun watch this season. Well, and I have one more question for you because we we talked about Joe Burrow and how he's okay with getting sacks. Granted, you don't necessarily want to take a sack, but he's That's still right. blue collar and he can do that. But he, last year he sacked, what was it, 50 in the regular season? Yeah, 80 yeah. total, I think. 70, 70 total. Yeah, 70, 70 total. 70, yeah. mm-hmm. 70 total. He still throws 34 touchdowns and he's got a, over a 70% completion rate, over 108 quarterback rating. I mean, what this seems like it has the ability, if the offensive line stays healthy and plays well, to be a buzzsaw of an offense. I mean, just torching everybody in their path. Yeah, you might say it was just the tip of the iceberg, right? And what Mm -hmm. we saw from Joe Burrow last year, according to the PFF database, he was the number one quarterback in the league when blitz. So he made you pay for it. If you came after him, you paid dearly. I think uh, Don Martindale, defensive coordinator of the Ravens, found out the hard way. Cost him his job, right? He wouldn't stop blitzing Joe. (laughs) And Joe just kept carving him up. I think the Tennessee Titans found out the more you hit him, the better he gets. This guy is a winner um, by every stretch of the imagination. Uh, It's an outlier, to be honest with you, to be one of the most sacked quarterbacks in the league one year ago and push the ball down the field the furthest with the highest yards per pass attempt, but yet he had the highest completion percentage of any quarterback in the NFL. It's hard to do that when you're on your back more than (laughs) any other quarterback in the NFL. Somehow Joe Burrow (laughs) found a way to do that. And (laughs) this is, I'll be honest with you, this is what we, many of us quietly, we wouldn't say it because it's, this is what we expected of him. This is what we saw from him. Mm In that magical run in 2019 at LSU, we we saw something so very special in this young man, and I couldn't be more proud of him the way that in short order, in 25 games, he's lifted a Bengals franchise that was at the bottom. And I can say that. Don't get mad at me, Bengals fans, for saying that. That's the reason why you had the first overall pick. All right. That means means you were at the bottom. So (laughs) he, he took a team that was at the bottom, and he's taken us to the top in short order. And uh, I love the way he said it last year. Get used to this um, because we're going to be doing this from here on out. I I love the confidence that he has and that he gives everyone else in that entire building. What does it say about a quarterback? Because I know uh, this week, Zach Taylor kind of mentioned that um, Joe Burrow in the pocket is so clear, so concise with his instructions to his teammates. And he mentioned that sometimes those instructions from the coach can be a bit wordy. What does it say about his mental aspect to be able to put that into understandable language for his teammates and then be able to execute at a level that they are? He's a bright young man. I, you know, you have to be that if you're going to succeed at quarterback in the NFL. It's, it's one of the things that we don't maybe talk about enough because what we don't want to do is brand someone for being unintelligent. Right. Right. 
So we just tend to kind of just give the people the kudos who have. I mean, that's what Tom Brady brings to the table. That's what Peyton Manning and Drew mm-hmm. Brees, the guy has an engineering degree from Purdue, by the way. <laughs> um, people don't know this, but Peyton Manning graduated cum laude in three seasons as a four year starter at Tennessee. OK, wow. uh, the, these guys, uh, Russell Wilson, I don't know if you know this. His father was a corporate attorney right here in Cincinnati, where Russell Wilson was born. I right here in Cincinnati. His father was that. And then his father left to go and work for some other big time corporation in Virginia. And that's where Russell Wilson was born and raised. But he has his father's mental acuity, mm-hmm. ability to take large amounts of information, process it. That's why in 2012, as a third round pick, just doing training camp alone, he won the starting job and has been a starter every single year since he's come into the league. And in 10 years in Seattle, he only missed three games and all three of them were last year. Take him to the playoffs in nine of those 10 seasons. So, look, we, we can't underestimate uh, the football IQ that's needed to play that position. We're yeah. fortunate to have not only a talented guy in Joe Burrow, a tough guy in Joe Burrow but an extremely bright guy that has great leadership skills and every single guy in the huddle, they can't wait to follow him. I mean, they can't wait, whatever he barks out, they're going to do it because they know he's right. They know he has the, the answers to some very complicated questions. And I think he's proved that by cracking the code to NFL defenses every single Sunday teams that start to blitz them. Mm-hmm. They, they sooner or later find out that that's not what you want to do against Joe Burrow. True. Sully, I appreciate you. I have one more question. Do you have a prediction for this for this game? Like a, I, a score yeah. prediction. Do you even yeah. do that? <laughs> uh, I no, I really don't. But I can. I'll do that for you at least. How about that? Thank um, you. I, I'm gonna. I'm gonna. It. I'm gonna take the Bengals in this one, thirty to twenty one. Um, Cincinnati okay. Bengals get the win, and the offense has a big day, particularly uh, Joe Mixon in the run game. Our offensive line is gonna shine this week. Okay, so after listening to that conversation, I'm sure you know exactly what I'm talking about when I say that I always learn something new whenever I listen to Solomon Wilcott speak. He has so much knowledge and he just rains it on all of us and those who love stats love hearing him speak. And I was fortunate enough to talk to um, new captain Ted Karras this afternoon. And, you know, we talked about Frank Pollock and what his message is going into this game on Sunday and what his mentality is going into this game. And I, you, after listening to this interview, you will absolutely be under, be able to understand why Ted Karras was voted a captain in his first season with the Cincinnati Bengals got the Steelers coming up on Sunday, um, a retooled offensive line, as you obviously know. Um, but how well are you guys gelling and how are you preparing for such a vicious um, defense like the Steelers have? You know, any matchup's going to be tough in this league, but uh, that front seven has uh, been exceptional for a long time. Um, but I think we're gelling pretty good. You know, we've had about three weeks of work together as our, you know, you know named unit. And, uh, you know, we're feeling good. Had a good day yesterday. Got to put another one today. Finish on Friday. and. Obviously, all come down to performance at 1 p.m. on Sunday. What is it like protecting a guy like Joe Burrow, who even when he was sacked the most of any quarterback last year, is still able to put up the highest uh, completion percentage while being sacked as many times as he did? Yeah, you know, he's an unbelievable quarterback and such a, you know, it's a great privilege for us. And we got to hold up our end of the bargain. We have phenomenal skill players here. Our offense uh, can be very explosive, but, you know, us five up front have to, you know, come through and, you know, do our job to the best of our ability. And the Steelers, it's mainly pretty much the same roster as last year. Um, one of the worst teams as far as run defense goes. Um, how beneficial is it for you guys knowing that? Maybe you can, you know, run the ball a little bit, lean on those guys a little bit more and wear them down. Yeah, you know, we're going to have to establish a run in every game. And, you know, the Steelers are obviously going to fix some things from last year that they did. But, you know, um, our matchups are tough, but we have a good scheme. Frank does a great job. Coach Callahan, Coach Taylor have a great job putting us in the right positions. But it's going to be on us to execute. What have you heard about this kind of rivalry? Because in years past, it's not, I don't think it's the same right now, but in years past, there have just been so many injuries that come from this game specifically, just because the two sides seem to have hated each other for so long. Yeah, this division is pretty, uh, all the teams are pretty, you know, it's going to be a slugfest this year. Um, But, you know, I've played the Steelers many times. You know, it's it's always a tough physical game, obviously starting with Cam Hayward uh, and Mm -hmm. TJ. Yep. So, um, you know, we're going to have to be at our best. We're going to have to be our best physical selves, uh, mentally, physically, 
and emotionally because it's going to be a three hour uh like i said slug fest so and hopefully when the dust settles we come out victorious and i know today is pads um what has frank pollock told you guys what has been his message so far this week going into the first week of the of 2022 well it's about execution for us it's about all physical in these guys they are a very tough um bullish defense mm -hmm. and uh you know we're gonna have to stand up to these guys and you know impose our will uh whether that is run or pass so um, his message has been just execute practice hard and uh you know let it loose on sunday afternoon and last question for you it's it's a fun one it's not All about right. football there's one food in the world you could eat it at 6 a.m two in the morning what is it cheese fries Ooh, good i love choice. cheese fries yeah okay i'm down for that. any kind of cheese fry i love Wait, yeah. is it chili cheese fries or just strictly cheese uh, and potato? I'm not a huge chili cheese fries guy, but I will eat it. But just like, you know, with uh, Shake Shack has really good cheese fries. Yeah. yeah I like a cheese sauce with my fries. So. Are you a person who dips your fries into the shake? I have, but I'm a cheese fry and then <laughs> ketchup over the top of that, eat it with a fork. Love it. I'll be honest, I was not expecting <laughs> Ted Karras to say cheese fries. Very low maintenance, a nice little comfort food selection right there. I would personally have to go with uh, spaghetti and meatballs, homemade marinara, homemade meatballs, of course. Um, I could eat that at any time of the day. Uh, much like Ted, I could, if you said spaghetti and meatballs to me, I would be there within a snap of a finger. And that's just how it is. It's ha that's how it is with your favorite food. Okay, and I also was able to speak with Jonah Williams this afternoon. That one player that I was speaking about earlier, he's the one player from last year. So he's seen how bad it got last year in the offensive line room and years prior. And now he's seeing the retooled offensive line. He's seeing new talent around him and working with these new guys. And of course, you want to hear things like culture change. You want to hear things like um, how he's getting used to their mannerisms and how they're getting along, things like that, chemistry, team chemistry between the five of them. Um, and he spoke a lot about that. Here he is. Um, well, obviously, it's a lot of new faces. Um, mm -hmm. I think that's pretty obvious. Um, but I just, I've been really impressed with how the new guys have come in and kind of assimilated in the culture, but also added a lot to the culture, too. You know, um, all hardworking guys and I think that you know it's been a really smooth adjustment to have all these new faces come in but you know I think that we all buy into kind of the bigger picture of like what this team is about and the sort of culture that we started building last year um, and you know looking to build on that this year. What is your mindset going in knowing that you're going to deal with an Alex Highsmith and Kem Hayward, TJ Watt, like those kind of guys, that type of aggressive physical play coming at you guys 24-7? Yeah, I mean it's a, it's the NFL, so that's to me that's every team. You yeah, know, that's a, that's everyone we play, and obviously the Steelers have great defensive front, um, talented guys. Um, but I think that the way that we look at it as as an O line is we're the ones bringing it to them. You know, we're not sitting back and taking anything. We're we're the ones who are setting the tone, and that's what we're going to do on Sunday. How important will it be to run them down with the run game? Sunday. Got to run the ball to win in the NFL. You know, yeah. like obviously we have great quarterback, great receivers, um, but we also have a great running back and a great line. And I think that once we uh, we start getting the run game going, it's going to open up stuff in the pass game. And then, you know, it wears out the defense a little bit just to keep pounding on them. What has Frank Pollock's message been to you guys so far this week? Um, a lot, a lot about the physicality that we need to bring that we were just talking about. Yeah. Um, but also just like, you know, crisp and clean with our technique and communication. That comes first, and then the physicality comes during the play, and you know, at the end of the play when you're when you're kind of setting that tone and finishing. Um, you know, but it's got to start with great communication, working together up front. A lot of new guys, um, so got to work together. And I've noticed a, a few people talking just this year about um, Joe Burrow and his ability to communicate clearly mm -hmm. um, and concisely to all of you in the huddle before a play. How important is that, um, especially when you're executing at a level that you guys were last year and towards the end of the year? It's super important. That's part of, I mean, obviously Joe is super talented, great quarterback. Um, everyone sees that. 
but you know his presence in the huddle is really good because like you said it's really important to get the play across clearly everyone understands um and you know once we get up to the line if he's got to make adjustments make calls whatever then you know he's been great about doing that gets us all on the same page and then it allows our talent to shine because everyone's on the same page and last question for you the term glass eater for those who do not know will you define it for us <laughs> uh the glass eater frank's word is uh <laughs> You know, it's 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 a it's a lineman who's just nasty, gritty, um, you know, willing to do whatever, you know, um, not intimidated by anyone and ready to eat glass. Well, and you're such a kind person. So how do you get how do you switch into that mode on the field That's of just, being a nasty, you know? It's just football. You know what I mean? It's just like we've been doing our whole lives. I've been doing my whole life. So. Um, <laughs> I go out there and I execute my assignment and then in the process of that try to you know leave an impression be physical um, and make them feel it that's kind of the that's what we have to do. Frank Pollock has said numerous times that he does have a room full of glass eaters and we will be able to see that against one of the toughest defenses in the AFC on Sunday at one o'clock. I will see you here on Sunday afternoon. I'll be here with James Rapine and I'll also see you next week on Thursday at eight o'clock.